Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jose. Uh, the session is going to be using OpenAPI to improve the development workflow. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Altus, a company based in Costa Rica. So if you ever want to go surfing, you can call me. We can do it in Costa Rica. Um, I'm also one of DevNet's biggest fans, so that's the hoodie. And I'm also a Cisco Spark ambassador. So this whole talk is going to be about using these technologies like Spark and some development technologies. The agenda is fairly simple, talking about the challenges, the solution that I'm going to uh, provide here, and some recommendations after this, this talk. One of the challenges that we as developers face every single day it's um, with the speed of development. Every single time they ask more and more code from us and do it even quicker than they used to do uh, a few years ago. Another challenge when you are part of a development team, it's actually keep with the best practices. So everybody has their own set of best practices, their own set of rules that they need to comply. And it's difficult for us, um, you know, for a team of developers to actually um, do that. They, they're pretty much, and it's the final part of consistency, pretty much every developer has their way to, of doing things. So one of the challenges here also in this uh, of, and the solution that I'm trying to provide here is how we, we can actually automate this kind of tools and this kind of um, use open API to improve that consistency and to improve or enforce those best practices that we want in our a APIs. And the other part is uh, documentation. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm a technical guy, so I hate documenting stuff. I love going to work. I love doing coding. I love going to the CLI. But actually writing a manual, actually writing documentation, it's not really my thing. And that's probably one of the most common things that I, or complaints that I get from technical people. They don't want to write um, docs. They don't want to write info. They just want to go to the code and do their stuff. The solution that I'm providing, it's going to focus on these technologies. So it's basically using OpenAPI, previously known as Swagger. Within OpenAPI, I'm going to show you about Swagger UI. It's a great tool to actually go ahead and do some documentation. And if you have worked with the Spark API, you'll see that kind of same live documentation where you can actually go ahead, click a button, and then execute an API call right from those docs. Then use the Swagger code gen. That's going to be the tool that we're going to use to actually take, take that specification that we have and auto-generate code. Within Swagger code gen, we're going to use Mustache. That it's a the template, uh, uh, template or the template specification that we use for this um, that support in Swagger Cogent. And then just showing some quick examples using um, two Python libraries, Flask, for the server. So I'm going to build a Spark server that's going to emulate the Spark API, just like a proof of concept. And then, yeah, using Click, that it's another Python library, I'm going to build or I'm going to show you uh, how I built an, an a Spark CLI. In case you want to do some automation, if in case you want to do some other stuff, you can do it in a CLI. Like, for example, if you need to add 100 people to a room, it's easier to go through a CLI and do it some automation stuff than going exactly to the, um, to the interface and doing all the clicks that you have to do. So those are the solutions that I'm going to take. I'm going to show you the different things that I'm going to use to solve the challenges that I mentioned in the previous slide. The speed of development, the best practices, the documentation and the consistency that I, we're looking for. So first, let's talk about OpenAPI. OpenAPI is a specification for uh, describing REST APIs. It was previously known as Swagger, but then a couple of companies joined and actually changed the name to OpenAPI. And it's actually a community effort to improve how um, APIs are being documented and defined. As you can see here, um, I'm going to give an example of how you define an, OP, an API. And this is actually 
the specification or a specification that I did for the Spark API. So for example, you get the people endpoint, you get the operation that it's get, information, for example, the operation ID, the summary, the description, and some information that you get in that, for example, the parameters that you'll send, like for example, in the, the name is ID, you'll see in the, in the query, the description, and is it required or not, and the different kind of things that you can have in that. So it's fairly easy for developers to define this description and then give that to the front-end developers, to the back-end developers, and they can work in that specification. Then you can use Swagger UI. Swagger UI is a great tool where you can actually go ahead and load the specification that you just defined and have some live documentation right there that I'm gonna show you in a couple of minutes. After that, we can actually go ahead and use Swagger Cogent. Again, sorry for the name change, but they changed it from Swagger to OpenAPI. I'm using the OpenAPI that is official name now, but still some of the repos or some of the tools actually reference, like for example, Swagger UI and Swagger Cogent still reference the old name. Swagger Cogent actually allows to have that specification that you define and auto-generate libraries for different languages. For client languages, we have 3 plus uh, already supported. For server uh, generation languages, we have around 14. And for example, in this server part, one of the languages supported is Java, but you have like six or five ways of doing things in Java or you know, different server specifications. So it's 14 languages, but within those 14 languages, you could have two or three or more things. So it's, it's a whole, um, it's a lot of information, it's a lot of ways of you can do things, and it'll help you a lot when you're actually developing using this. And as I said before, one of the things that I like the most, it's you don't have to stick what, with what the repo supports. You can actually go ahead and define your own templates. And for example, the officially supported is actually generating client libraries and generating server um, or backends. But what I did or what we did at our company, it's actually use that kind of logic, use that same tool, generating our own templates and actually use that for generating a CLI um, tool. So it's not only backend, it's not only the SDKs, but you can also use that to, to um, some, other, some other needs. What we use, again, where it's being done in the project, it's using Mustache, that it's a logicless template. And you can see, for example, the different information you can use to actually go ahead and generate code with that. You can ask, for example, the information about an, um, an operation, the name, the class bar name, the description. You can go ahead and figure out if it has more items or not in that definition. When you have a variable, when you have a variable, like query stream variable or a variable in a body, you can ask different stuff. For example, is it numeric? Is it a string? Is it an integer? And in this case, is it a container? Is it part of our list or not? And that allows you to go ahead and generate code. For example, it's different the code that you can generate if it's a string or if it's a binary or a double. And you can use that to actually go ahead and make changes in your code and auto-generate with that information. Does it support templates? Sorry? Does it support templates? Yeah, so what it supports is actually Mustache. It's a template language. So you can use that. And when we say it's logicless, it's not like you can do an if this is uh, less than five, then do that. But you can, for example, use has more to figure out if, if it has more parameters, then I have to do this. If, it's, if this is the last parameter, then I have to you know, set this code. And we'll see an example of, of how it's being done. And finally, just you know, for the proof of concept here and just to you know, show some code, 
I'm going to use Flask, that it's a Python library to generate microservices or to generate backends. And then click that it's, again, a Python library to generate CLIs. OK, and now we have done with the slides. Now we jump to the demo. Give me a sec. Okay, so the first part. Again, we have here the Spark specification using OpenAPI. So what, what I did, it's actually take some specification that I was already available in GitHub that is done by Nick Maris. I used Nick's job, uh, work and actually improved a little bit doing some other of the new Cisco Spark um, APIs or endpoints for licenses and events and things like that. And we actually define here the different, um, let me remove this, okay. And you can see, you can define here, well, the title, the Spark API, the version that I defined here, the URL, sorry, the URL for the documentation, the host or the URL for the actual API that I have there, in this case, api.ciscospark.com, some other information like the path and what produces, like in this case, JSON and consumes JSON, you can yeah, maybe consume or produce XML as well. And you have information like in this case, and this, the, this is a first example. So in this case, uh, information about, let me give me a sec. Information about um, summary, the description, and the information that I get here, you'll see the response, it's gonna be, if it's valid, it's gonna be a 200 response code, and it's going to reference a, a person. And in this definition, I actually explain or uh, define, specificate what that person is. Let me just, give me a sec. So you can see that that person object, it's basically an ID, the emails information, the display name, that nickname, the first name, you know, the whole information that you have in a Spark um, person. And I actually can go ahead and load that information to this Swagger UI. And as you see, I'm jumping from a specification that I had in a file. I'm jumping to this, and I'm loading here using HTTP, right? Just using Swagger UI, and then have that live documentation right here. If you're using Spark, you don't need that because that information is already available in Spark, in developer.ciscospark.com. So this is just an example of how I'm using that information. But again, I have this live information here, that live documentation. I can see the description that I got. Oh, wait. The description that I got here, I can see it in the documentation, right? I can actually see a code um, or an example using curl to actually access that information. And I can have the information about the um, request body here. In this case, I already authorized it using a Spark token. And I can go ahead and do the tryout. Okay. It's not authorized because I haven't defined the token here. So I can go ahead and do authorize.
define the access token. And execute again. OK, there you go. Now I have a 200 response code. And I have the information about that specific token that I used. Because what I did is actually call that endpoint of people need that returns exactly the information about that user that uh, with that token. In this case, it's a Spark bot that I have named date and the different information for that. So what I'm going to do right now is actually show you the, inf uh, the templates that I did, the templates that I'm using to generate that code. OK, let me show you the code. Give me a sec. I have here a very simple code. Let me just show you how it's working. OK. The same request that I did in that API, in that I'm going to generate the code. OK, so that same request that I did here in that, those live docs, that same request is the one that I generated from this CLI. And that information or that CLI, that code, it's the one that I have here. So how did I did that code generation? It's basically using this mustache template. So I'm defining a header, right? It's some information that I can just set up for this code generation. I'm using the different information for the APIs. In this case, I'm just defining, sorry, I'm just run. Okay. I'm just importing some uh, Python libraries. In this case, import clicks, that it's the library that I told you that I use for the CLI generation. I'm using Cisco Spark API, that it's an open source library that exists to integrate with Cisco Spark. And I'm defining using the operations, the different operations that you can have in an API. So for example, in this case, the people me operation. And using this template, I'm using operations. Then for each single operation that I have, I can go ahead and um, iterate over the different params that you have in that operation. You can ask if it's a body param. If it's not, I can define it here to ask for that information using that CLI, and then make that query using that function. So for example, and I know this looks like you know, gibberish or somewhat garbage, but using that information, you can go ahead and generate that CLI. So from this, from this I actually get this code without having to do some other changes. So I define the template like that. So for example, I have here the operation. I, have, I define the Python function here. And it's a function that I'm getting here. So I'm using the nickname. The nickname in this case is me. That nickname, it's one of the things that I get from that specification. And then define the different parameters. In this case, that function does not have a parameter, so it's just blank. 
And then I do the sparkle api.people.me. As I define here, API, I'm using the base name, I'm using the nickname, and then sending the parameters. Okay. In this case, again, it's, it's empty. And then defining just to print that to that, um, to this console. Okay. So that's a very simple use case, right? It's not fairly complicated. It's just to show you how you can use that template to generate that CLI. But let's make it a little bit more complicated. One of the things, again, um, with consistency is this is the way that I code. But it's not maybe the way that somebody, uh, you know, my colleague codes. It's not the way that some other person maybe in a remote office codes. So how we can actually work together to make the code consistent all over our uh, different options. So we can actually use that template. We can actually use that and just auto-generate the code for everything that we do. We can just work on the specification that we have here, right? And we can go ahead, write out that documentation, and with that, we can use a CI, CD pipeline to auto-generate that code. I have another example here that I'm going to load with more information about Spark. Let me see. Okay. Now it's just not the people me, but I also get information about how to create an, a user, how to get any information from a specific user, how to update a user, how to delete a user. And if I was doing this as a coder, I will start doing some code. It will take me, you know, a couple of hours to define that in the CLI. It will take me a couple of hours to define that in the, in the different backend. But I'm going to do it fairly quickly. Now I have the specification. Now I have the template. Now I can run something that auto-generates that code for me. And in this first case, the only command I support It's people. I can go ahead and it's just me. And that's the only thing that I support right now. But I can go ahead and give me a sec, just show you. I'm going to remove the code that I already have in that folder. So as you see, it's empty here. And using the same templates that I defined, and just changing that specific file that I'm actually given here. So this is the input. This is the template that I defined and just the output directory. Uh, as you see, you'll see the code being generated here. Okay, now I have that info here. And in this first step, again, I only had the people command, I only had that specific endpoint, the me one. But just getting that other file and getting that other information that I sent I'm going to head, go ahead, CLI, Swagger Client, 
And using this same information, I'm just sorry, I have to enable my Python. Again, just the people one, but within the people one. Now I have the create, delete, get, list, me, and update. So for a developer, this will be probably hours. Go ahead and enable every single one of those operations. But if we work right, we can define the specification and then using that utility to auto-generate that code. I can go ahead and say um, people list. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. In this case, I'm um, have to send some information in all it's about, so it, it can actually register people from, from the organization. Let me uh, give it my token. Give me a sec. My token, give me. to see what problem that I have. Well, in any case, I can actually generate that code. Now it's working, okay. I can actually go ahead and generate that code, right? I can have, I can show you that code that was being generated in this case. So from that first file that I show you with the people information, In this first step, I just got the people me, right? But now using that code generation, I can actually go ahead and not only support that, but support the different options that Spark has. So not only the people me, but I get also the list information, the get information, the delete information, the create. And I did not have to do a go ahead and do all that coding. I just use that template, I just use that file and auto-generate all that information. Which again, it might not be that interesting with just five endpoints. But if you're testing maybe 20, 30, 40, it'll save you a lot of times, probably even days. So if you work not harder, but smarter, if you actually take the time to define these templates. If you actually take the time to use a tool like, a tool like Swagger Cogen, you can probably go ahead and save even weeks in, in a complicated environment. One other thing that you can do, and one of the things that I like the most, is how you can actually go ahead and enforce best practices. In this case, one of the things that I'm not supporting, it's, um, I'm gonna show it here. Generate this one. Okay. 
Okay, I'm generating like another file that I had that you can see not only has the information about people, but also have information for rooms and messages. So I'm going to try to get a message using that CLI that I'm auto-generating, try to get a message from a Spark. The first problem that I'm going to face using that, it's Again, it's the bot. Now, not only do I have the people command, but I also have the messages and the rooms command. You can go ahead and search for information for a room. I have the different information for a room, create, delete, get, list, and update again in a room. Go ahead and list. Get this information from the room that I have with that bot. And I can have the information for the messages. Let me say list. This is going to fail. And one of the problems that I have, and one of the things that you can actually do, it's in this case, when you actually go to a Spark and ask information about messages, you have to send at least the room ID. And I can make that required for all the information or for all the parameters that are required in this specification. So I'm going for the template. Okay. And here is where I define the different options that I support in that CLI. So I'm going to make for all the options that are defined in that specification re as required, I'm going just to change one line here and it's going to auto generate again the whole code for the different options. So let me, I have the file here. Okay. Okay, now I have this, it's required. So in the code that I have so far, here, CLI, Swagger, Cogen, so sorry. For the messages, you can see that when I'm listing a message, I'm not saying the room is required. I'm just, you know, accepting that, that um, parameter. And here, when I ran that, it just gave me an error saying, you know, that it's, it's giving an error that it's a non-type. But now when I change this and I included that, that specific parameter asking in the template if it's required or not, I can go ahead and save it. I can auto-generate us again. And now when I run the same command, it's going to say that the room ID is missing. And the change, it's fairly simple. Again, now when in the code, I can go ahead and see that now it says that the room is required. And it's going to say it for 10 files, 20 files, for every single operation that I define. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you can do it right now. If you Yeah. 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 Would it be useful to you if it's published? Oh, absolutely. Yes, no. Are there any of these required? 
Yeah. That, that, that seems like early. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's not only, I'm showing this, this for the CLI, but you can do that the same for a backend. In the case of Spark, it's not needed, but you can do it for an SDK, for example. And I'm actually using Python here because I think it's an easier language to show in a presentation. But this work is actually done in our company for Go. So we are generated using this stuff, we are generated a Go SDK for, for Spark. Yeah, you have a couple of officially supported that, yeah, you can use in this stuff and if you enable that Swagger, you can probably say to people, hey, you can use that Swagger code gen. It needs to be, you know, um, modify a little bit for your own company, for your own interest, because it's very general. So at least what we do is actually use that tool and then auto-generate using our own templates because it supports our best practices, the way we want to define our functions, or things like that, right? So, but yeah, absolutely. If, if you actually publish that, it will be um, a lot helpful for developers. Okay. Uh, and again, well, very really easy, just making a change in one file, just making a, you know, including this part, it was easy for me to, again, auto-generate using those, that template, and affect every single operation where a parameter is required. So not only in this one, but if people had, no, give me a second. In this case, the ID to delete a people is also required, and this was also included, I didn't have to go and write that code or didn't have to go and check, is it required here or not? I just used that specification and auto-generate that code. Again, this is you know, somewhat straightforward. It's just a couple of uh, endpoints, but I have, if I have an, uh, an end, uh, specification as big as the one in Spark, I can get another file. In this case, I have a fourth file with all the specification, the Swagger specification for Spark. I can run that code. Again, very quickly, I can get that information. And all the different endpoints from Spark. Contents, license, membership, messages, organizations. So if you have a big, big, big API, you can go from just having that specification to having your server backend, your SDK, your CLI in a couple of minutes. Obviously, you need to do some previous work. You need to work on the templates. But once you have that, you can pretty much define the server, the information for um, the CLI, the information from the SDK in a couple of minutes. One other thing that I was mentioning was the documentation. So in this case, one of the things that it's common using Python, it's defining the doc string. So in the function here that I have, you can see that it's, it's, I don't have information here about the function. So again, it's a best practice, one that I can enforce very easily using this. I can go here, say, I have already that information in the specification. So I can go here, define variable that I have in the, that's part of Swagger Cogen. I can go ahead and run that information, or run that command, and then check that. Let's go for people. Let me see, summary, steps four. Okay, 
you see. Now I have the information here. Again, easy, just two lines of code, and I auto-generated that whole information for the whole a uh, API. I have here that documentation, so now a developer can work in the specification, and they'll know that information will be in that CLI or that SDK or that backend. You see here in people, I have the same information for rooms. I have the same information for memberships without them having to be in the developer police and going with my developer and say, hey, why didn't you include that? We just give the tool, the right tools. We just tell them you can have this information, that specification, and I can, again, very easily R generate that. Back to the presentation. The challenges that we said was speed of development. And I show you very easy in this 40 minutes presentation how you can actually get from one specification to generate a complete CLI very, very quickly. And again, you have to work on that template. But once you have that, you can use for basically your own uh, APIs, you can use that for, again, in our company, we're using it for Spark, but in our company, we're also using it for our own APIs. So very easy and all actually integrated with our CI, CD pipeline. Once somebody pushes information about a new specification, the API, it all generates codes for the server, the backend, and for different languages, in our case, for Python and for Go without the developers having to go and uh, write those, that code. Best practices. I show you how you can actually go ahead and say, yeah, maybe just define that best practice in this template, like having that doc string, or having the um, variables name like this, or having the uh, functions name like that. And again, you will auto-generate that code for you. Documentation, you'll have that, again, easily. You just work on that template, and using something like Swagger UI that I'll show you, again, using Swagger UI and using the specification, you have that, that whole information at the tip of your hands, again. And for developers, this is super valuable, having actually information when you're bringing a new person to that team, you can just Send it here, say, that's the whole information for the API. You can go ahead, test it, you can go ahead and see it. And it's, again, very easy for, for them to ramp up. And the final part that we um, said it was a challenge. Uh, let me. Was the consistency. Now, if I have a CLI developed by me, it's not going to be different from the CLI that's developed for a col by a colleague. It's not going to be different from a CLI that's developed for a third person, right? We're already going to have that same boilerplate, that same information for the CLI, we're gonna have it. And it's just, again, the logic is gonna be different from you and me, but at least that documentation, that way of defining things or of setting parameters, it's going to be the same. The final part, the steps that I recommend, obviously learn more about OpenAPI and Swagger. There's another session today by Ashley Roach that it's creating a REST API microservices using Swagger node. Then you can go ahead and again, just if you have a simple specification, this, uh, this one using Spark, it's available on GitHub. So if you have that, you can run some simple tests using Swagger Cogen that it's also available in GitHub. Then you can identify repetitive tasks in your team. Let's say it's generating documentation using an API. Let's say it's generating a CLI. Let's say it's generating some other functions that you need. You can use this tool to actually improve that workflow. And the final part, again, it's work smarter, not harder. Try to work, try to un I understand, uh, see the different tools that you can use to actually automate stuff not go ahead and jump to doing, start writing code, but figure out if there's a better way to actually do that, those, those repetitive tests. And the final reflection that I went, or a code that I, 
a tweet that I liked the, a lot was, was for Jessie Frasell. She works for Microsoft, I believe, in the Azure team. Hire the people who will automate themselves out of a job and then just keep giving them jobs. I, I mean, it's, it's probably uh, one of the things that, that I like the most. I mean, if you actually are good at automating things, yeah, you'll stop doing those things, but you'll find time to do you know, more work that provides more value to your company and to the organization in general. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much.